Welcome, everybody, to episode 18 of The Resistance. I am here with my friend and co-host, Joe Gallagher, and we have the distinct honor of being joined today by Dr. G.C. Dillsaber, who is well-renowned as the father of Catholic psychology. He is the author of books like The Three Marks of Manhood, uh, Psychomoralytics, and now he is coming out with a new book, which is called Crucial Christianity, an ethos theology for the third millennium. And we're here today with Dr. Dillsaver to, to talk about his new book and talk about how exactly it intersects with faith and culture in year 2020 and beyond. How are you doing, Dr. Dillsaver and Joe? Yes. Hello, David and Joe. Uh, good to be with you. I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much for hopping on with us, Dr. Rutsa. It's great to have you on. I'm really excited. Uh, I know I'm kind of talking back into uh, pre-show, but I'm excited to get into a little bit of a discourse about the upcoming book and a couple of the points. So, yeah, thank you very, very much. So just jumping right into the uh, to the meat of the book, um, the heart of your thesis, can you tell us what is your book about? What is Crucial Christianity about and what inspired you to write it? So Crucial Christianity, and the, and, the, and the subtitle is an ethos theology for the third millennium. So I suppose the first point would be to say, what is an ethos theology? Uh, it's something that is unique right now to Crucial Christianity, but an ethos being a way of life, mores, the way we exist. So the point is, this is not presenting new dogma. It's not presenting new revelations. What is doing is saying, these are the crucial truths of our faith. And this is the way we live them out. The way to live them out without distraction, without compartmentalization, without compromise. So that's what an ethos theology is. And then you look at the, at the title, crucial. What does crucial mean? The definition of crucial. Well, we all know the common understanding and it's, it's of vital importance. But crucial also has another meaning, cruciform, conformed to the cross. And it is exactly that which is of vital importance to Christianity, to the holy faith. It's Christ crucified and that holy cross. So that's the essentials. And again, whatever we do, and it can be liturgical, it can be moral, the holy cross is always the touchstone of orthodoxy. Are we going toward it or are we going away from it? That's our touchstone. That is our North Star. We can never, ever take our eyes off of that. And you can gauge everything you do, every single thing you do, as is it leading me closer to Christ crucified or away? So any, any questions on that? Well, you know, I think that that's definitely a theme that we like to touch on with resistance in general is that the faith life, uh, it's not stagnant. There's never a prolonged period of time where you're not moving forward or backward in your spiritual life. Either you're ascending towards the heights or you're not. So I think that that's a very, very true point. If you ask me, I think crucial Christianity, it just sounds like by that second definition, authentic Christianity more Absolutely. than anything else. Absolutely. And, and the, with the crucial aspects of it is that we have these included in that there's a concept called the crucial vocations and there's, and there's natural vocations and there's supernatural vocations, seven all in all. But uh, a lot of times we miss, you know, somebody may say, well, I want to be, you know, a priest or a monk or a nun or get married. And they, they're, they're focused on that, but there's all these prerequisite vocations that don't require discernment, but require assent and acceptance. So what are some about crucial things? Now, you know, as you, as you know, I, with three marks of manhood, I've been involved in the, um, the issues of uh, masculinity and femininity for a long time, but that's a crucial vocation. It's the, it's the, the second one. The first one's a second moral vocation or the image of God vocation, Imago Dei, where we're creating God's image and as rational volitional beings, analogous being, sharing in his functionality, uh, similar functionality, but not nature. But the second one is incarnational images of God, unlike the angels. And there, of course, is our mortality and it is male 
or female, he created them. It's, it's a crucial vocation. It's not something that is, well, you know, let's not micromanage here, okay? <laughs> but no, it's not micromanaging, obviously. It's more than skin deep. It's uh, genetically deep. And so uh, these are crucial issues. And people don't look at them, you know? I mean, how can you be a, a good priest or her good husband if you're not a good man or a good nun if you're not a good woman. So these things are all crucial and they're all prerequisite vocations. So when I say crucial, I'm saying we're going down to the very essentially, essentially, essential, non-negotiable facts of our holy faith. And in doing that, sometimes the book will rock the boat here and there because at times things that are less crucial, sometimes even accidental, can obfuscate, obscure the crucial truths of the faith. And the issue now, you know, the other question you asked me, you know, follow up, you know, what is it that caused me to want to write this book? Well, like, I, I don't want to write books. Uh, I write books because I, mean, I feel they need to be written you know, because no one else is writing them. So that's how it was with the Marks and Manhood, Psychomoralytics, and this book as well. But this book is really, again, a, a whole – it was the easiest book I ever wrote. It's 550 pages long, but it was the easiest book I wrote – because it was about a lifetime of living out the Holy faith. And I was just talking to uh, David about, we were both have, have our common backgrounds as poor pagan children of uh, Southern California. So, um, so all those, what you go through to get to follow Christ crucified. And so this is about this lifelong existence. I was in the seminary when I was 14. Um, and so I've been doing this, you know, really my whole life. But through that time, you know, it hasn't been just this constant ascent, you know, into, into Nirvana. Uh, no, there's crises, you know, so you have crises and you go through those crises and then you have a chance to resolve things one way or the other. Now you can either, you can stay stagnant and you can kind of do the same things you've been doing and just kind of, you know, fake it you make it, but you know, by the great grace of God, you'll make it and be saved. But that's not the way to live the Holy faith out. It's, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's a lukewarm way to live the Holy faith out or a crisis can cause you to apostate. You know, and you see that happen, you know, like, Oh, look at these, you know, all the, 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 the priest scandals or the Pope or this or that, the other thing, you know? And so then you, you, you lose the faith. Um, or you can go through that crisis of the faith and go deeper into the faith, mm -hmm. deeper, 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 deeper. And that's what our Lord Jesus Christ wants. That is the dynamics of Holy Mother Church herself. It's to go deeper and deeper throughout salvation history. And so it's not about going back, you know, trying to recreate the Middle Ages. It's not about going back and trying to recreate the 1950s. And I've worked with people that grew up in the 50s and the 40s. <laughs> Now, you know, older people, but they grew up then. I know what the deficiencies they're in. Well, no, rather the salvation. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry to, to jump in on you. I just wanted to say, yes, there is danger in this. There seems to be a false dichotomy right now between either becoming a progressive Catholic that leaves behind doctrine or going back and saying the church is rooted in you know the the preconciliar age in the 1950s and therefore there can be no legitimate development in her, her liturgy her understanding of her own um doctrines not to say they change they do not change the doctrine but it can develop it we yes. can come to a fuller more robust appreciation of timeless 2000 year old doctrine, which isn't to say that it can contradict past doctrine, which is what leftists mean when they say right. doctrine changes or develops. But when yes. the Orthodox among us say that doctrine develops, it means we come to a greater understanding of what certain things mean. And this is really true. You can see it in the realm of say conjugal fidelity and marital sexuality. You know, the early uh, church fathers who wrote about this had a very um, unfriendly, to say the least, understanding of marital conjugality. And because they had these Manichaean roots, they, they had fallen into some of these heresies that said the body was a bad thing. But we've come to understand that marital sexuality, not only is it not a venial sin, 
uh, the way that St. Augustine saw it, um, as almost always being, it's an affirmative good where we get a, 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 a overflow of sacramental graces and a renewal of those wedding of our wedding vows when we engage in the conjugal act. So that that's one place where we've seen a legitimate development of doctrine. And there are other places where it can legitimately develop and we can come to a fuller sure, yeah. understanding of it. So we don't right. have to go into the past. We can remain faithful sons of the church while embracing some of, uh, w well, I should say, um, we can remain faithful sons of the church, but without artificially placing ourselves in 1955 or having this anachronistic view of Christianity and Catholicism. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as we talk about, you know, that is, you know, that's, that is a form of, you know, LARPing, if you will. So, you know, we don't want that, that false understanding. Our faith is something that's so deep, so lived out, so spontaneous, so dynamic. And you have to have that sort of faith to be able to remain steadfast, to grow and to bring about God's kingdom in the third millennium. And this is really what this is about. If you now in crucial Christianity, now David, I think you're going to really appreciate this because I can talk with traditionalists and they may not necessarily like what I'm saying because it does call for a reform, but a reform of as in a purification, as in a reform, as in a conform to Christ crucified. But they can't argue with it because it goes down. And really what it is, the real, the development of doctrine, if you will, is a greater definitiveness. And when you have a greater definitiveness, you have a greater simplicity, a greater purity. And again, that highlights the very essence, the crucial aspects of our holy faith, and especially as they need to be lived out in this hostile, antichristic third millennium which is an age of crisis. Let's face it, it's crisis. It's a crisis. But out of that crisis can come a deeper faith. So this book then was, is the result of that, the result of, you know, if you will, 50 years of living the holy faith, you know, for, you know, for better or worse. And thank God for my, when I was 14, my consecration to the blessed mother and holy slavery by the grace of God. She keeps you on, she keeps me on her chain. Right. So thank you, Jesus. And, but this is what the result of that. And the crisis right now we hear about, Oh, the crisis in the church and everybody's you know, hair is on fire about the crisis in the church. Okay. So now I call, I'll call this a crucialism, if you will. Here's a crucialism, and, and the book starts off this way. So I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. There's no crisis in the church. Yay or nay? I mean, I would say, uh, just jumping into it, yeah, absolutely, we're looking at a crisis in the church where we have prelates out there that are not holding fast to doctrine who are a lot of them closeted homosexuals who are trying to usher in homosexualism or homosexual friendly teachings into the church under the guise of pastoralism, of being okay. pastoral. My, uh, I don't mean to cut you off, Dave. Go ahead. Um, I'll just wrap it up. Um, and there's a failure. It's not just what they're saying, because there's a lot of heterodoxy, but there's also a failure to preach boldly on things that are countercultural. So it's a case of the dog that didn't bark. I mean, how many of us have gone to mass and just heard garbage homilies about how to drive like a Christian while we have these elephants in the room, like most Catholics using contraception, many Catholics getting divorced, um, many Catholics um, being 
voting for pro-choice candidates, for pro-abortion candidates, like half of us voting for guys like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I mean, that, to me, reeks of a crisis. And at the right. very yeah. top... Okay. Now, Dave, Dave, can I say, that, by the way, um, driving like a Catholic, and you'll see this in Christ, Christ, Christianity, I don't talk about driving per se, but maybe this is just a personal defense. I think driving like a Catholic is to follow the spirit of the law. <laughs> So I can open road ahead of me, okay? You know, I I, I can uh, put the uh, pedal to the metal, okay? Doctor Sorry. Dale Saver, if I uh, if this is Joe, I think Hi, Joe. Uh, before I could answer, uh, I would ask you to define church because I think that, uh, good, yeah, that would be uh, that would change the answer. Yes, absolutely, yes, that's uh, right because that is that is exactly right, and, and we define the crucial of Christianity. It goes into that very deeply because. In the past, and even today, and especially in traditional and conservative circles, I, I, I mean, even in Norris Ardo, there's one thing the church is identified with, it's gonna be with the hierarchy, with the magisterium, with the parish. And it was all about the magisterium, and that was it, the church. Well, who's the church? Well, it's the Pope, you know, he, and he personifies Catholicism, and it's the bishops, and, and we all exist for them. And this was quite a phenomenon, and it started way back in the Middle Ages. And it's continued on. But no, the church is the mystical body of Christ. The church, first off, and this is, we're going to get into the, because this is such an important point. Because then we look at it, we say, well, okay, so did, did you see what the Pope just tweeted? Well, no, and I don't really care. Because it doesn't matter. <laughs> because I know what the church teaches. I will say, no, there is not a crisis in the church. I mean, yeah, we got bad bishops. I mean, you know, I got bad priests. I mean, you know, this is, you know, but. So what? We have bad Catholics. It's not about them. Because, Mike, you know, I would say is, what is, if there was a crisis in the church, that means that somehow there was a disagreement, a truly Catholic disagreement, or, or inability to ascertain what the Catholic truth is. And there is not. This is in God's providence, in his salvation history. Today, because the danger of personality cult, because of the danger of, of, of everybody having a platform out there, you know, the Pope himself becoming a um, personality uh, cult figure, is that we don't have to have access to personalities. We have access directly by that same technology that makes personality cult possible. We have access directly to the teachings of Holy Mother Church with just a touch of a finger. Today, and after 2,000 years, Holy Mother Church is there in all her beauty, her unblemished, pristine nature, full of truth and grace. And as Cardinal Newman said, it is our informed Catholic, divine law, natural law, informed conscience that is the primordial vicar of Christ. That's where we are today. So the Pope, I mean, we've seen it. It didn't start with Pope Francis, by the way. It started you know, back with John the 23rd uh, with this dismantling of the royal heirs of the papacy. You know, you, you know and, and, and fine, you know, I'm not gonna condemn it for the past, but you know, again, all those royal heirs aren't necessary to the papacy. In fact, the papacy now being very deconstructed under you know, under Pope Frank, if you will, is, is, is okay. Because what, what is the primary function of the papacy was to infallibly unpack dogma. And once it's unpacked, in, unpacked, as our Lord Jesus Christ said, Peter is there to be the foundation, the, the slab, the rock upon which Holy Mother Church is built upon. Well, what happens? Now Holy Mother George is built. Take the scaffolds down. Take the royal trappings down. Take all the worldly powers down. And allow the Pope to be relatively uh, obscure under the edifice of Holy Mother Church. Because she, he had, the papacy, Peter has fulfilled his role. Today, we are, the Pope is less important than ever. Well, the wait, bishops let me are less important than ever. There. The uh, priests are less important than ever. And they're here for one reason, their ministry is to minister unto the faithful, all the faithful from Pope to peon. Let me challenge you there, Dr. Dilsaver, because under this 
um, rendition of what a crisis in the church means, wouldn't that preclude things like the Arian heresy and the Nestorian heresy, yes. things that really yes. rocked the church right. to its core? It Under would. your definition, it doesn't seem like those things would qualify as crises. And then yeah, number two, it, I would say that it seems like that could be construed as an overly reductionistic view of what the Pope's role is, because in addition to being the rock upon which the church is built, as Peter is, uh, he's also there to confirm thy brethren, confirm his brethren, as Jesus tells to Peter. Right. And, and that would be primarily, and I will say, and, and it's in the book, so uh, it's going to take some, some study on this, so it's hard, you know, but I want you to look at this. Please do, David. This is very, I appreciate this. So, Yes, confirm your brethren. I will say the papacy now more than ever is about confirming his brethren, the Epis episcopacy. And the bishop's job is to confirm his brethren, i.e. his priests. And and then his priests are there to confirm his brethren, i.e. the faithful. So it's a ministry service. And I will say, no, all those heresies. No, that, that's exactly what the papacy was there to do, to unpack the deposit of faith in an infallible way. And that's what they did. And that's what's done. And now today... All dogs have been defined. I mean, maybe, you know, except for, you know, maybe Blessed Mother as co-redemptrix, you know, but don't hold your breath for that one. <laughs> but, but, you know, so it's been defined. So we know now exactly what the heresy is in Arianism. We know these heresies, and he can make accesses. So, so quite the contrary, all of that, ha he has done his job. And so that rock is so important. But let me say, but there is a crisis, though. There is a crisis. But it's not in the church. The church, it, it, but it is between the church and the world, the antichristic, apostate world, the satanic state in the culture, perverse popular culture, what has rejected the gospel. That's the crisis. And yes, that's why you have apostate bishops or apostate uh, faithful or apostate whoever, because they are acquiescing to the world. They are not embracing the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a crisis, not in the church, not in Holy Mother Church, who is spotless, unblemished, her teaching is more certain and accessible than every other in the history of the world. There's a crisis between the church and the world. Now, who, who resides in that place between the church and the world? When I think, uh, what, what this makes me, what, what comes to mind when I'm hearing your uh, your reasoning and your thoughts, Doctor, is uh, is when Christ talks about whether or not there will be any f uh, any faith left when He returns. Um, so it seems like you're trying to dismantle uh, what a lot of people conflate between the teachings and the precepts of the Church and the members of her. Now the teaching, oh, the, the, there's the, the teaching of the Church. We are members, you know, of Holy Mother Church, the mystical body, insofar as we are holy, insofar as that is, insofar as we ascend to the truth and do the good. And so that's how we're incorporated into that church, if you will, becoming, you know, whereas, and, and that means in our own person, very specifically, that means the decreasing of myself, or analytic principles, decreasing of the pride and self-love, the manifestation and dominance of the Imago Dei, which is God's analogous being in us, but even more so the indwelling of Christ himself. So no longer I live, but Christ lives within me. And then I fulfill my vocation to become a soul that magnifies the Lord. So there's not really a the difference there except for the fact, but I'll say that who is, I mean, all then, all Christians, all Catholics are, faced with that hostile antichristic world and specifically it's not the papacy or or the episcopacy or the, the clergy that are on the front lines they're there to minister unto the faithful and to the families specifically the families who are on the front lines they're the ones that are in between that gap between the church and the world they're the ones that are on the front lines they must be ministered unto and therefore, we go right back then to the book I wrote 20 years ago, Three Marks of Manhood, and these fathers taking responsibility to lead their families. Now, I don't wait for the Pope to tell me what to do. I know what the church teaches. I have no doubt what the church teaches. I have no doubts whatsoever. And so, but 
I do have doubts when I have to go out and live it out and I'm facing the enemy. So I must be encouraged to do that. And I must, and that's why we need to form again, those small faith communities, live this out, the domestic church. It's all about the family today. It's all about the laity today. This is the age of the laity. This is the age of the laity. If I can say something that, you know, traditionalists uh, would be, uh, I want to throw sprinkle holy water at me for saying, but it's the age of the lady. Why? Well, not because it's the age of the Eucharistic minister or whatnot. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the Vatican II clericalism, by the way, that says, oh yeah, it's the age of the laity. So, hey, you know, you can be like a priest. How about that? Well, what do you mean? No, that, that's clericalism in and of itself. It's like feminism saying, oh, yeah, feminism is great. You know, you can be like a man. No, wait a minute. I don't want to be like, I'm a woman. It's not true feminism. So it's a falsehood. Sure. So well, I want to jump in there and just say, of course, Gaudium et Space from the Second Vatican Council talks about how the laity are going to be instrumental in evangelizing and catechizing the world. And truly, we're seeing that played out. And there is a danger when we're looking to Rome, not just for doctrine, but for the application of each doctrine. Um, yeah. th there's a danger in that because it's easier to err in applying the, the facts to the law than it is in just saying what the law is. So in moral yeah. theology, there's a distinction but between what's called syndaresis, which is the conscience's recognition of the eternal law, and sinaitesis, which is the application of the recognition of the eternal law to a specific set of facts in your life. And one way where we see this play out and the magisterium, I think, has really stepped in it, is with the death penalty and the recent revisions to the catechism of the Catholic Church on something like the death penalty, where we see sure. Pope Francis saying it's inadmissible. Well, right. we know from on the basis of the catechism of Trent and sure. even in um, John Paul II's papacy, they're very clear that the death penalty is not a per se evil. It's not an intrinsic evil. It's admissible circumstantially, and it's even a good when it's properly admitted. The thing is, what Pope Francis is essentially doing is looking He's acting like a sociologist. He's studying the government or the penal system of apparently all of the criminal justice systems in the world and saying based on their state of development at this point in time, these things, uh, since you can incarcerate people at this point in time without them having the ability to escape at a dangerous enough rate. Therefore, the death penalty is inadmissible. And it's there where he's acting like a sociologist and doing this sinaitesis where he's particularly prone to error because the fewer of these graces, these charisms that attach to the magisterium are going to attach in his application of law to facts. So yes. there is a danger in us looking to the magisterium to apply the eternal law, which they can say infallibly what it is, to yes. every set of circumstances in every um, single day of our lives. So Absolutely. is that where you're it's going with this? It's ineffectual too, David, because, and you know, it's number one, by the way, Vatican II was a pastoral council, which is silly to begin with because, so, okay, we're going to have them set pastoral practice from on high. We're going to have this worldwide conclave of bishops and ivory tower intellectuals, and they're going to decide what's best for the blue collar Catholic, the common man. And that was the first essay I ever wrote, blue collar Catholic back in 1990 for the remnant. <laughs> so, you know, and it's absurd. No, you tell us the truth. We live it out. And this goes totally contrary to subsidiarity. And again, totally, this is for you and I to ascent to church teachings and then to apply it and to pray for the inspiration on the grassroots level, because this is where a new Christendom is going to arise. Again, it's going to arise from those families. It's not going to rise from on high. It's not going to arise from a prince becoming Catholic and then his whole people becoming Catholic. It's going to rise soul by soul, family by family, small faith community by small faith community. And that kind of Christendom cannot be stomped out. That kind of Christendom is not going to topple down like Christendom one did, which was very extremely top heavy. And it was, and again, the book goes through this all the way from the high middle ages, all the way through the counter reformational period, all the way to Vatican II and the clericalism and the top heaviness of it all led inexorably 
to the crisis in the church uh, or among the faithful that we live in today. So I agree hundred percent with you. It goes totally contrary to subsidiarity. And we have to in, understand that the church's teachings are clear. It's not the teachings aren't clear. What the hard part is, the crisis, how do I live it out? How do I live it out? And again, crucial Christianity is anchored to the fact that number one, it's about embracing the cross. It's about not being afraid of humiliation and sorrows. It's about loving. It's about having a greater love. It's not my faith. I know what the truth is. My faith isn't the issue. My love is. I have to love, and perfect love casts out all fear. And that's what we need to do. We need to gain militancy. And that is, on the grassroots level, that is, in the familial level, that is, for these fathers and mothers, that's what they need, they need to be imbued with. Yeah, doc, uh, Dr. Dilsaver, the Church Militants Resistance Program, we are uh, officially the size of a what would be a Roman legion throughout the uh, United States. We have over 6,000 members from coast to coast. And um, it very, it really is the grassroots echoing uh, the, the Sheen quote. It is, it's up to the laity make sure the bishops act like bishops and priests act like priests. I do have a question for you. And this is, um, this is kind of a, a question mark and we try and answer it the best we can based off of circumstance of particular locale, whether it be uh, somewhere in California versus a little bit more rural of a place like Arkansas. Uh, what would you say would be the best way to convince a a bishop that is not of orthodox mind to uh, to become of orthodox mind? Now, of course, we have prayer and fasting being the most important. But on on a um, on a direct level, an influential level, what would you what would you say would be the most effective tactic in your opinion? Well, you know, I, you know, again, I've been doing this a long time. So I've, I've hung around a lot of bishops. <laughs> okay, so this is a true story. The first one that let me drive a car by myself when I was only 14. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was, I was going to the seminary, Southern California, our lady queen of angels seminary. Um, and uh, it was, professor from St. John's Seminary, LA Archdiocese Seminary. It was a Cardinal, well, Bishop Father Leveda then. He was Cardinal Leveda. He was the one that was appointed prefect for the congregation of the doctrine of the faith by Ratzinger when, when he became Pope. So this was his handpicked guy to replace him in the congregation as a prefect. So, so Bill Leveda, God rest his soul now, he, uh, he's the one that first let me travel a car by himself after mass. He goes, you know, he was over there one summer and helping out. We had breakfast afterwards. You know, when you're seminarian even back then, you know, you, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're ramped up. And so I'm having breakfast with the pastor and him and Deacon uh, Ed Clark, who's now a bishop in LA too. Um, and uh, so, so pastor O'Connell, Monsignor O'Connell says, you know, uh, you know, Bill, why don't you, you know, you know, drive Greg home. And so he did, he got to, he goes to the pastor's car and then he go, looks at it and goes, you want to drive? And of course, you know, again, you know, we got blood, blood an American boy. I said, sure. Heck yeah. I never drove before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any 14-year-old boy would so, uh, yeah. so 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 the so the prefix of the congregation of Doctrine of Faith is the first one to actually let me drive a car solo. Uh, but um, so so I've been hanging around these guys for a long time. And I met Bishop Sheen the year he died, by the grace of God. I had a private audience with him, which is a great blessing. Um, I've been uh, so I've been hobnobbing a lot with clerical culture and and um, and, and that's a miracle in itself. I'm still Catholic, right? <laughs> so sorry. But, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, but the point of the matter is, is that, so I'm pretty jaded and pretty cynical about a lot of times because you get to the chancery and there is this, a, a clericalism and there is a discounting. And I'll tell you what, you know, one of the great, you know, and they must teach you this in, 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 uh, in Bishop school, but, uh, um, to just, uh, you know, put somebody off, you know, they can close doors, they can shut you down. They can, you know, cancel appointments with amazing, um, ease. So, you know, we've been dealing with this a long time. And however, I just recently, and we talked about other places, Southern California versus Arkansas, where we are Northwest Montana, right? It's the, which is known as the last place you go before you expatriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but uh, I just talked to this. He's a young bishop and uh, just newly ordained, been ordained about nine months now. And um, gosh, I, he's, uh, but so he wanted to talk to me. We had some, we've had some uh, religious orders up here. People come up here for retreats and everything. So we do a lot of work within the church. So he wanted me to come down to the chantry and meet with him and, and, and some of his, uh, of the other priests here, vicar general, et cetera, chancellor. So I went down there and I brought my chancellor with me. I brought my wife with me. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so we're there sitting there and it's funny because he comes in, he's been Bishop nine months now and he sits there and he just kind of starts pontificating and, and, and all the priests and everybody, you can just, there's, there's kind of the <laughs> syncophants, you know, I'll have to say, and uh, he wasn't say anything bad. He's a good man. I mean, but it was, it was pious platitude and everybody just sits there and, you know, um, starry eyed, um, because he's a boss, right? And he's a boss. And plus he's a boss that is appointed. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's, that's a big danger to, to fall into that kind of, you're, you're pretty much, uh, impervious to, uh, to criticism. So he's there. And then anyway, I, I, as I, as the dialogue continued, I spoke with him probably almost two hours and about vast majority of the time I was speaking. And as I'm talking to both of you now, you see, I'm really a mild mannered guy and, and I don't like to really put myself out there. But at that time I had, um, more cups of coffee that I have in me now. And I, I just basically preached the gospel to him, you know, right between the eyes because he was of the mentality already that it's about the bishop. It's about the bishop. It's about us. It's about the, the parish. It's about the mass. It's all about us. No, it's not. The parish and the mass and the diocese and the bishop are about the faithful and this unto the faithful and helping them live it out in their homes. Absolutely. And you know, you know, that's where the cross is embraced. That's what these, that's what these families needed. You know, you know, this is where these, these heroic mothers that are staying up, you know, all night with a, with a, with a, a feverish child. This is where the cross is embraced. And so to remand this back, and this is what I challenged him to do. And I challenged him, and I tell you, I challenged him very, very, very strongly. And, and the priests around me were looking at me like, you know, <laughs> they're like the jaws are dropped, you know. Oh, <laughs> no one's talked to his bishop, you know, at least twice for the last nine months he's been bishop. And all of a sudden, you know, you walk on water. And he's looking at me. <laughs> I think my life, my wife was kind of, uh, kind of, you know, you know, grabbing me or my, my leg under the table. So kind of saying, you know, <laughs> Hey honey, just kind of pull it back a little bit. Yeah, grab exactly. Down. That under the table grab everybody. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Grab it down, honey. Warning grab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, after he's looking at me, I got, and I, so, 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 so what do you think about that? And I was in a, at this point in my life, I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, <laughs> a bishop hates me, whatever. I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm over it. I'm not too, too uh, worried about it. <laughs> but uh, he looks, and he's kind of looking up in the air. And it's, it's really interesting. He's kind of looking around going, he's hemming and hawing. Hmm, well, you know, he goes, you know what I have to say about that? Amen. And it was amazing. He's, he said, amen. Now he's a young guy. He, so he hasn't been as constant this, but he's also, he did a stint at North American college in Rome where he taught theology and taught graduate students, priests and, you know, uh, theology students. So it was interesting because he was moaning over his mind. He didn't like it. He didn't say, I like it. <laughs> so I have to say this because it was true. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. He, I, mean, I know he didn't like it. But he said, I have to say, I have to say, he was, it was like he was being forced to say amen because I have to, because it's, there's no, there's no heresy. There. There's no falsehood there. So I say if by, by any chance possible, and this, this is a big problem I have with traditionalists and, and especially those, you know, like the society of Pius X or what have you is that if any chance you have, you want to be able to sit there, right there, face to face with a bishop or with the Pope or with anybody and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And get it and on do video. do not be afraid to do so. Yes. Make sure that, I think the other point is with that is he had all of, uh, not all of his, but uh, he had many of his priests there. So it would yes. look 10 times worse in re regard to optics if he were to start to uh, combat the truth. You know, he has to, and I think 
you're right. Uh, dialing, going back to a, an earlier point, it really does seem to be that the the princes of the church are saying, well, that, that's me. It's about me, and it's about having these odd popular masses and the funny homilies, and nobody can mm -hmm. meet with me because I'm the bishop, and that is right. absolutely not true. Look at St. Michael, the prince of the heavenly hosts, the, right. the most prayed to angel, uh, right. interceded to, I should say, uh, is the lowest of the low, our blessed mother, the lowest of the low. Humility personified, that's right. And who? And the apostle, this is this is important because I, a part of my book too, we talk about the priesthood. I'm very hard on the sacerdotal scandals, and I talk about them being based on hubris and the spirit of clericalism and you know, which imbues the person with superiority because they have the office of Christ's high priesthood. I mean, that is, that's falsehood and that's wrong. To be a priest requires incredible humiliation, humility, because when you're ordained, you must be subordained unto Christ himself. The man does not matter. Our Lord Jesus Christ picked the salt of the earth. In fact, he picked men covered in brine he didn't pick the Pharisees or the Sadducees. He picked humble men because it's not about them. It's not about their talents. It's not about their personality. It's all about Jesus Christ. And that's humiliating. Think about that. You know, a priest. So what? What? Like as one priest, a conservative priest told me this, but he was complaining to me, oh, people think I'm a sacramental bending machine. I said, well, you are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> well, and that's the absolute truth. Here's it something is. that's been lost. The highest duty of the church is the salvation of, of the, the faithful. Yes. It's yes. Noah's Ark. That, you know, we, I was just talking about this because I teach classes on, on homeschooling and home economics. And I was just saying there's a deficiency because in a lot of these Old Testament stories, people learn them like they're trivia or if they're just like storybook stories. And they're all really about Jesus, you know. Jesus says that in the Gospel of John. What Moses wrote, he wrote of me. The, the ark, Noah's ark, is a symbol of the church in the future that saves us from death. That's why it's important. We have faith in God. We enter into the ark, the church, and we are saved from the waters of death. Water is always a symbol of death in scriptures, just like the Red Sea. And eventually we are baptized in water because we die to ourselves and are born again in Christ. The salvation of souls is the highest um, calling of the church. It's her highest vocation. And I don't want to diminish the fact that there is a disparity of, I, I want to say, um, oh, what's the, give me one sec, I'll just edit this out. I it got tongue tied. Um, there is a gradation, there's a hierarchy in vocations in the church with the priesthood uh, dogmatically, doctrinally, being the higher vocation than the lay vocation. So I don't want to, there's a certain egalitarianism that's made its way even into faithful Catholicism that says whatever your vocation is, that's the highest for you. No, the priesthood is objectively higher, but it's a calling of <clears throat> service. And that's why Jesus says that he who serves the others the most on earth is going to be the highest in heaven. So if you want to be the highest in heaven, you have to make yourself the greatest servant of all, which is what, right. the, therefore, priesthood, therefore, the priesthood <laughs> must be a greatest call to service if it's an objectively exactly. higher vocation. Absolutely. They're chaplains unto us who are on the front lines, and that's their job. They're not to be on the front lines. They're not to be out there, you know, they're not to be the heroes. It's an unsung job, if you will. That's the way it should be. But by the way, David, let me just say that it might not be the best motivation to say, I'm going to become a priest so I can have the highest place in heaven. But anyway, I'm saying <laughs> that could that could attract the wrong personalities. But the point of that well, hey, I'm married, so you know it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> so so the but the point of the matter is it doesn't take any special talents to confect the Eucharist or to absolve in sacramental confession. It doesn't. And so, oh, so what? So what? I can speak, you know, you know, three languages. It doesn't matter. I mean, all it does matter is it, it's the simplest act. So that is a humiliating thing. It's not about the man. Yes, you are just there so that Christ can work through you. Now, the humble, and this is such a beautiful thing. Think about this. The, 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 the priests that I've known, the, the, the best priests that I've known, were very humble and unassuming. For instance, St. John's Seminary uh, in L.A., 
Um, and I was just talking to a priest that came up here, was visiting um, from Phoenix, but, and I didn't know him before, but we, he, he, we were talking and somehow he, he had gone to St. John's at a different time than I did. And he said, yeah, there was just like, really, there was only one priest there that, that I thought was really holy. And, I, and he said, yeah, what was his name again? And I said, you talk about uh, Father Eberhardt? <laughs> he goes, yeah, yeah. And no one knows Father Eberhardt. I mean, no one would give him the time of day. This priest did. So I knew this guy was a good man right away, this priest I was talking to. But Father Eberhardt was the archivist in the theology library. And he'd actually come, I lived in Thousand Oaks, so I lived close to the seminary. So again, that's why I met Bill Levada. And, and then Father Eberhardt also said mass there. But, you know, no one would ever give him the time of day. Nothing about him was a spectacular he was so unassuming. You wouldn't even give him the time of day, but, but unknown to most people, but Father Eberhardt was the one man chosen, and this is how he used to do it at Archdiocese. You only have one man, one priest. He was chosen to be the exorcist of the diocese. So he was actually engaged in an incredible drama, but he was also the most down-to-earth, humble man you know, you'd ever meet. So that's the kind of priest we need. We just need humble men, salt of the earth. It doesn't matter. You don't have to go out there and, you know, give great oratories. You don't have to go out there and dazzle people. You just have to, you know, be there and allow our Lord Jesus Christ to work through you, minister unto the faithful, exist for the faithful. And even though the, the priesthood in its, in its majesty, because the fact is it's not about the man, it's all about our Lord Jesus Christ, his high priesthood, has a superiority, but it's there. Our Lord gives us the priesthood itself. And this is in the book, Crucial Christianity explicates this. The priesthood is pure gift, as is the Holy Mass and the Eucharist, pure gift. And you read the book, what that means, but pure gift so that they can minister unto the faithful. And because the ultimate vocation is always going to be that call to holiness. Again, specifically, the decreasing of self, so Christ may increase. It's no longer I live, but Christ lives within me to become a soul that magnifies the Lord. And that's what everything in the church is ordered toward, that holiness that we were talking about, the salvation of souls. That's what it's all ordered toward. And that's what a priest is ordered toward. That's what religious are ordered toward. That's what every single family is ordered toward. That's what holy matrimony is ordered toward. Amen. Yeah, Scott Hahn had this quote. Uh, he actually posted it on social media. Uh, end, of, end of summer, early, early fall. Uh, he said, what if holiness isn't about getting bigger and better, but smaller and closer? Yes. And that, that quote rings so true to this conversation and to that point. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It has to be very clearly explicated. And I do talk about this because, again, a lot of this was lost. It was lost. Um, uh, and, and see, that's good. For, I mean, Scott Hahn, you know, as a convert and, he, and, he, and he going through, and now he's going through, I think, when he comes up with something like that, it means he's continually going through that conversional process, going through crises and going, coming out with a deeper, and if you will, a smaller faith, a more essential faith. But personally, it means, again, that decreasing of self, that pride and self love is exactly what holiness is, is very specifically. And we get a lot of times, even in that, in that counter reformational spirituality, you know what wrong, what wrong am I now on the on the uh, on the ladder of sanctity? You know what what mansion am I in? And that can really maybe it wasn't problematic back in in, in in 16th century Spanish Catholicism when even though they were prideful, they were able to order that pride. But for today, for today's person, who I call tech narcissistic man, today's person, it can become very problematic. You know that pride and self love is so easily fed. And so with me, very specific, no, this is about that decreasing of self. That's what it's all about. That in achieving that loneliness of our blessed mother. And that's a crucifixion of self. That's an yes. uncomfortable thing to do, to yes. deny oneself the, the quote unquote joy or the pleasure, the short term pleasure of pride. And, uh, I should, I should say false pride. You know, it is okay to have uh, pride in certain things, but, um, a disordered pride. Um, that is a crucifixion to self. That is that crucial aspect of Christianity because those are many deaths, every Christ. single one, in preparation to that final death. Absolutely. And you're talking about the holy angels. Well, again, so let's talk about pride. I'm specifically, you can use pride in a 
in exactly, but, but, but strictly speaking, pride in and of itself is an apostasy from God, a turning away from God. So the holy angels, you know, there, and this goes down to the psychomoralytics dynamics, but, and Thomistic understanding of uh, epistemology. But of course, our rasa tabla, the intellect, receives, receives objective reality. So, you know, especially the holy angels in that, in that pristine state, pure intellect, the first thing that they received was, I am. I am. He who's, you know, is, whose essence is existence. And that struck their impact, impacted their intellect. And then their cognitive understanding of that entailed, and I am not. And that's where the choice came. Do I accept that? Or do I rebel? And so, yes, St. Michael, like you said, Michael, who is like God, that, that Hebraic question, you know, like how absurd. But, you know, God is God and I am not. Praise God. And they rejoiced in them not being. They rejoiced in the creature. They rejoiced in their lowliness and God's allness. But the fallen angels, they rebelled. God is God. God is God and I am not. But I want to be. And they turned from God, apostasy, pride, to self-love. So that is the specific dynamics of what pride is. And so to say yes to humiliations, to say yes to sorrows, to say yes to rejection, even being rejected by the church, even being rejected by your local bishop, you know, to be considered to be criminals, you know, you know, and let's face it. I mean, to be outlaws today in our culture, in our state, because if you assent to divine and natural law, if you assert your right, your absolute rights to do your duty to God, you are an outlaw. And that takes humility. You know, we're not going to be considered, oh, you're great, nice, conservative man. That's wonderful. No. You're going to be considered to be radicals. You're going to be considered to be outlaws. You're going to be considered to be criminals. And that's humiliating. So, Dr. Dillsaver, do you go into, in Crucial Christianity, what you're seeing as the main problems vexing modern society are? Yes. Yeah, can you give us, uh, what would you say they are? And then what is truly the remedy? What's the recipe for overcoming this and to restoring order and integrity to the church and to the world? All right. And again, you know, the book's 550 pages, so it's probably, uh, again, I recommend, you know, reading it, and hopefully we can revisit this sometime if you're you're still willing to continue the conversation on uh, in the future. Of course, we love having you on. Yeah, I always love, uh, you know, your work has meant a lot to me personally, and, you know, we've had conversations in the past on rules for retrogrades, and you're always an erudite guest, so you're always welcome. Uh Thank you. Um, but, you know, the, so that terminology I use, tech narcissistic man. So um, the, uh, someday in some sort of a, in, in a dig, they may, they may uncover tech narcissistic man. He'll be under a lot of red tape and, and pill bottles and, uh, and they'll uncover him and they'll find him there. And you'll, he'll have appeared to have died without any, um, in any trauma whatsoever, just kind of a dumb smile on his face, blissfully unaware. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is technoistic man, tech light like Cro Magnon man, right? So <laughs> if I can delve into uh, evolutionary theory, right. but uh, Cro tech narcissistic man, he's this. We are so narcissistic, and it's been enabled by the technology because we're out of touch with natural law. Now. It doesn't have to be that way. We're not Luddites. We can, you know, you know, we can use modern technology. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, you never, you know, you never know, you know, you never know what you're missing until um, you get a tractor. And realize how to do anything without my tractor, right? So, <laughs> but technology is a good thing. However, we've fallen into the point where we're rejecting natural law, and that itself is based on rejecting the gospel. So. This is Western civilization. This is all the erstwhile Christendom. And these are uh, some of the most decadent nations. Of course, you know, France and Germany, Italy, 
Ireland. You know, they've all apostated. And, and so when you have a culture apostate like that, it's not like the pagan cultures of old who were ensconced in natural law. And they were open to receiving the gospel. Now, when I say ensconced in natural law, be, again, make it very succinct. That means I embrace the cross of reality that life is a veil of tears. And they knew that. They accepted that. And they were there. And so then when you preach the gospel, and then you preach Christ crucified to them, well, you run to Christ. You run to that cross. You enter into the depths of reality. It's only the faith can do it. And you gain the courage to live fully within this veil of tears. That's Catholicism. But today's West has apostated. It's based, it's very essence, a specific difference is it has rejected the gospel. It's anti-Christic. And anti-Christic in many ways, not just in its hostility, but in the fact that it apes the gospel message with political correctness. It pretends to be angels of light, just like the Antichrist himself will be. But it does not have the wounds of Christ. It does not have the cross, which is our touchstone. So we, our culture, then that means. Our culture, and David and I were talking about this a little bit earlier offline, but what, we were talking about the Marine Corps. So, But my wholesale discounting of the institutions today that we have of our culture of the satanic state and the state satanic people say, well, we can't say that. Can you? Well, they kill babies. Don't they from the highest courts of the land for the last 50 years, it's been sanctioned. They hate religion. So, they, you know, they're persecuting Christianity. They're they do. shutting down reparative therapy do. for homosexuals. Yeah. It's satanic. But they are, they are just that. Well, you know, I, you know, some years ago, I, I, uh, with my my practice in um, psychotherapy and more, um, you know, it was Catholic psychotherapy and still psychomoralytics, but under the under the under the uh, um, guise of psychology, I got in with some families and some that were that were in the three letter organizations in D.C. And so, so now I'm starting to work with these guys. And, and what happens? You work with one, you know, person, then they tell someone else. And so, I, so I, I had this big slew of working with three letter organizations, which is a little bit nerve wracking. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I always, you know, I knew. I mean, I was I was at Quantico, Virginia, in the Marine Corps, um, and the FBI academies there. And you know, after the Marine Corps, I realized our policies weren't on the side of the angels. That we were doing a lot of evil, but. Uh, not until I started working with those organizations and seeing inside look into the actual personnel at that time. And it was, it was across the board in positions of power in every single one of the organizations, that's FBI, you know, DEA, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. I like that. You know, the, you know what the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, it always reminds me of that song and sound of music. These are a few of my favorite things. Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> Um, right. But uh, <laughs> the um, that every in positions of power because they would be complaining about you know superiors, they were all they were perverts. Perversity was being pushed. They were having and uh, you know and, and transvestites, homosexuals, especially transvestites is amazing. So this is so I realized it, it was a new dawn to me because I go yeah I know we're wrong politic I know we're wrong maybe politically or policy wise but. We're just down deep, perverse and satanic all the way through. And no, it's not just the top, the bad, a few bad apples at the top. Because if you want to get into an organization, if you want to get through the academies, you got to kowtow. You've got to drink the Kool-Aid. Because if you don't, they will not let you get through. So this is the satanic culture we're in. And that's why I say, and I will say, this goes contrary to this idea of the new evangelization, I think is wrong in, in one sense, not the spirit, but the idea that somehow this culture can be evangelized. It can't. It's based on the rejection of Christ. So it has built up antibodies to the gospel. It will be resistant. So you don't try to change that. Again, I say... There's no culture wars to be fought. We lost. 
<laughs> it's a joke. We've lost that war. I think there's a culture to be fought. It's been like in some Japanese found in a cave on the Pacific Island out there, you know, 20 years after the war is lost. It's been lost. But that's why. Now, that's also negative. Come on, you know. What, this, really, actually, it's very hope-filled. This is the way to be positive. This is the way to actually to make headway. Because unless I recognize, unless I clearly see the dystopic reality around me, I'm not going to be able to make my way amidst the ruins, the rubble. I'm not going to be able to create a new Christendom unless I truly and accurately evaluate the milieu that which I'm in. I agree. You definitely have to have a diagnosis before you get a cure. So we have to see, we have to look around. And this is actually one of the rules for retrogrades, which is there's really no room for optimists in our camp. We have to be realistic and look around the wreckage of Western civilization and say, we are in deep trouble. And there was something with the older generations where they're, you know, be optimistic. And I want to hear positive things, two positive things for every one negative thing. And it's just stupidity. It's stupidity. It's, um, you know, being in the middle of a tornado and saying, oh, this is nothing. This is just a mild thunderstorm. It's like, well, then you're probably going to die. You're going to become a casualty. Right. You have to acknowledge your serious plight before you can begin to tackle it. So we have to look around at American culture, at Western culture, and say what, to what extent it is a ruinous disaster. And only then can we begin uh, to rebuild. And at the same time, we need to be siphoning off people, you know, the the baptized pagans and the outright pagans that are among us so that they can be saved. We need to be evangelizing them and taking them away from the other side and bringing sure. them over to our side as we go along. Dave, that's right. that's money. You know, I want to say that the tornado point, it's imagine being a Catholic right now, a plugged in Catholic and saying, no, 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 let's not look at the tornado. Let's admire the plains right now and talk about how beautiful all this vast land is. People would look at you like you're crazy. Well, well that's what we hear. Well, yes. I talk to 50, 60 year olds and this is what they say. Like it is dogma yes. in their mind. Positivity is a good thing. No, positivity is just <laughs> as dumb as being committed to being uh, negative to being committed right. to being a pessimist. It's just that it passes for charity in the minds of the the stupid. Or or a false hope, I think is another, yeah. another good yeah, way. That's right, that's right. Yeah, it, this is a coping mechanism. It's, it's, it's an opiate, and we can't have coping mechanisms. We have to look at reality. Coping mechanisms protect us from humiliation. And so we, that's, we don't need that. We need to engage reality. I mean, when I was, I think I maybe. 18 years old, I, I first I read Orthodoxy by Chesterton, and he has a passage in there, and he goes, well, you know, we're not, of course, we know we're not supposed to be pessimists, you know, of course, you know, American way, the, the English way, but he goes, but we're not supposed to be optimists either, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, whoa, wait, no, that's, a, that's not the gospel I was raised on. <laughs> right, the gospel of nice, that's like exactly. the 11th yeah. commandment. Oh, yeah, the power of positive thinking, Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> And, you know, or, or, or the prosperity gospel, you know, I'm saved, I'm going to prosper. Yes, absolutely. It really is a step, uh, just a step prior to prosperity gospel is yeah, the absolutely. Just live consistent. The gospel. motivational speaker like gospel where it's like, just think positively. The Tony Robbins <laughs> your gospel. Your energy, your energy levels. <laughs> exactly. I get, when I give men's conferences now, and this goes back, I, I gave a, I, I think one of the first conferences I gave was to a, a big group, the Knights of Columbus traditional guy back in Buffalo, New York, had me go out there. This was when I was riding through Marks and Manhood. So, and, and there were all these, these guys. And back then, it, a lot of them were, the, were the, um, the greatest generation guys, right? Where these guys today got it from their fathers, this optimism. And, and so I'm there and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking to them. They're all very receptive and open. And then I start saying, you know, and of course, you know, you know that under your watch that, everything's gone south, you know, you drop the ball and whew, seriously. I mean, I, I started going that way and started saying, you know, look at yourselves and look at the failure because I guarantee everyone, you know, all their kids, you know, how many of their kids had apostated, right? And oh boy, I seriously, I barely got out of there, you know, without getting tarred and feathered. They could not accept feeling bad about themselves. 
They couldn't accept. Yeah, they want to complain about, you know, whatever, this or that, issues outside themselves. But look at your own life. Again, this ethos. Look at that where you're living, what you can do, what the actual place where you can cause change. And they didn't want to go there because, again, they were using all of this distraction, these issues to be anesthetized from the realm that they were supposed to take responsibility for and take charge of. A thousand times. Yeah, a thousand percent. Yes. I'm so sick of the self-congratulatory language of the greatest generation. Even, you know, you hear the generational warfare. It's like you've got the millennials over here and you've got the greatest generation. It's like, yeah, you won World War Two, but you also (laughs) raised the boomers who fell away and did drugs and had licentious sex in mass. You did a horrible job. If I could paint you with a broad brush as parents, that's not the greatest generation. The first generation of Christians, that was the greatest generation. Yes. So that's right. So self-congratulatory. Now, when I give men's conferences now, I usually usually start off just so they don't have any false expectations. I say, well, of course, I know you've all gone to a lot of motivational talks, motivational speakers. You know, guys, there's a lot of them out there, Catholics. and, And I say, well, just so you know, I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm a demotivational speaker. Hmm. <laughs> I want you. To, yeah, I, don't know. I want you to feel worse about yourself when you leave here. I don't want you to like all oh, these men conferences. You know, oh, I went to my men's conference. You know, because my wife, you know, set it up for me, and I'm I did my duty. I'm so good now, and now I'm going to try to stay pure or something. Who knows? I want to like, which is a, again, if that's the issue, we're <laughs> we're far from doing battle, but um, but they feel good about themselves because they do that. And then you don't do anything. I want you to feel bad. I want you to recognize, you know, that, that we're losing the battle. We've lost the battle. We, you know, every single day, the profane encroaches more and more upon our families. And if you're not out there creating culture, if you're not getting in trouble for the faith, then you're not living it out rightly. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I think that's where the glory is. Because when we walk away understanding that we are capable of pure evil, that we are constant failures, it makes us either choose to become self-deceivers and continue in these coping mechanisms, or it causes us to rely on the cross and to rely yes. on our yes. Lord. And, yes. and, that, that's, and that's the kind of men we need. We don't need, and again, I was on a, just a show yesterday, but and I've done this throughout the last 20 years. I was in the Marine Corps twice, okay? And I told David, I said, you know, the first time, Okay, you can count, you chalk it up to youthful exuberance. The second time, if I may diagnose myself, maybe a little bit pathological, okay? But anyway, but in the Marine Corps twice, and of course, what's the Marine Corps motto? The few, the proud. And I say, well, you know what? That's not the motto today that we need. Today, for Catholic men to go out there and engage the enemy, they have to embrace the fact that they are the weak and foolish. And God chooses the weak and foolish. Because what's that mean? It means, you know what? I can't fight this battle. I can't. It's overwhelming. It doesn't matter how hard I train. You know, it doesn't matter how strong my arm is. You know, they, they can blow me out of existence with, with a push of a button. They can destroy you. <laughs> just, just over electronic uh, shenanigans. We don't, have, we don't have a snowball's chance in hell. But the, I'm going to do what I have to do for love of God, for love of faith and family, regardless of the humiliation, regardless of the sorrow. I'm going to do it for love, and perfect love casts out all fear. Our pride and self-love has no place in that battle. Oh, I think that's a, a great way to close out the show. Um, and we are up against the clock, Dr. Dill Saver. But absolutely, we are called to be humble soldiers of God. And only by instantiating that virtue of humility can we truly become angelic, like St. Michael, like the angels, who knew that Christ was going to become incarnate like man and condescend to our level and therefore raise the human race even above the angels. And the angels still accepted this, um, this inversion of the natural hierarchy and were servants of God. And that's something that we as men need to inculcate in ourselves as we go on and we become soldiers of Christ and we try to make the world a more just place, a better place to sanctify the world as a means of sanctifying ourselves and getting to heaven. 
So absolutely. Um, thank you for your time today, and thank you for writing yet another another work to put in our library, um, Crucial Christianity and Ethos Theology for the Third Millennium. Please do go buy Dr. Dilsaver's newest book. Um, and Dr. Dilsaver, can you tell our audience where can they buy uh, Crucial Christianity? All right, if, if, I, if I have to uh, talk about the uh, satanic culture, they can get it at Amazon. <laughs> sure, okay, so it's on Amazon. And I always plug your uh your book the three marks of manhood which was really um inspirational to me when i was a younger man and coming up and discovering masculinity and a christian masculinity specifically uh please buy the three marks of manhood which is an earlier work by dr dill saver and we actually sell it in the church militant bookstore which you can access online we'll put a link in the show notes uh just another point of interest we're also selling for church militant our um our annual calendar and we would encourage everybody uh those of you who follow church militant follow our work closely please support the apostolate by getting this calendar but also you know it keeps you in touch with what's happening in the studio there are pictures of the studio uh descriptions captions of what the staff are doing and you can be like an inside member of the apostolate by getting the calendar so please do go out and get those calendars um please buy dr dillsaver's works and support his ministry in writing and i can tell you i can personally attest he's a great writer he's a very sophisticated and elegant writer so um with that said i know joe is here just uh brimming uh he's bursting with energy trying to uh, get out the call to action for this week absolutely dave um it's an easy one this this uh this week i think everybody should go inward and reflect on that Scott Hahn quote and the a majority of the conversation that we've had today, which is, is it about being greater and bigger or smaller and closer? And where are we on that? What are we doing in our lives that shows where we may be falling on that spectrum and what can change? Oftentimes the resistance is very strong in the actions, not words. But it's not necessarily just going to always be the rosary rallies and the petitions and the uh, exposés on the abuse or the investigations. Also, it's all about the internal actions and the spiritual development of self. Please, guys, click like and subscribe. Take this next 10 seconds and do that, please, for us. Support the apostolate in that way as well. And until next week, God bless you. Merry Christmas. And we hope you have uh, a wonderful season. Um, please keep us in your prayers. And do kindly uh, keep us in between your bills as far as donations go. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Dill Saver. You're welcome. God bless you. Merry Christmas. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.